So we've seen that Dworkin's analysis of the principle of justice and what is presupposed in that principle, moral responsibility or choice, freedom of choice, leads to this twofold principle of equality that must be promulgated and promoted in any just society. And that's the principle of equality of concern and equality of respect. And he believes that the only, that this, these two principles, equality of concern, meaning that no one is more important in the society than anybody else, society devotes the same amount of attention or importance to every single individual. But also, that society respects and allows each individual to make the choice as to what is the good life so that they can lead that life with real conviction and therefore be truly good people. So he believes that the only kind of practical equal distribution that does this is equality of resources. In other words, society must devote the same amount of resources to each person's life as anybody else's person's life. He thinks this is the only practicable ideal that can be brought to fruition in any society and therefore give any government the right to coerce because that's what governments do by their very nature, force people to do things that they don't personally want to do. But in order to do this, they need to be just. And the only justice that's possible is the promise of equality of resources. So then the question becomes, well then how? How does a society distribute resources equally? Well, this is where our thought experiment comes in. You might say our original position of an ideal society that starts from scratch and then divides the resources. And he used the example of a desert island. Now, he doesn't mean it's a desert. He means that there's no one there. And so these immigrants, these shipwreck survivors, come to the island and none of them, in principle, have any claim to more of the resources on the island than anybody else. And so thus, they would want to divide everything equally because each person has an equal claim to those resources. And he thinks that this is a good analogy for our lives. So now, what's the benefit of doing something like this, developing an ideal? Well, first of all, it will tell us what a perfect system of justice looks like. In other words, it gives us what is called in philosophical literature a regulative ideal. And a regulative ideal has two parts. It has to be ideal. In other words, it has to be something that it really does instantiate the notion of true equality, true equality of resource distribution. So he says this will do that for us. But also it has to have a practicality to it not ultimate practicality. It might be that that ideal will never be able to be put fully in practice on this earth. Maybe utopia is not possible, but it has to be able to be such that when we use the ideal, we can regulate our actual practice and use the results of the ideal to bring our society more in line with that ideal. And he thinks that what he's gonna show us can do that. So how will it, what, what, what are we gonna do? Well, we're a, bunch of native, we're a bunch of immigrants. We come to this island. We realize that there's, it's a very rich island. It has a lot of different resources and we wanna divide it equitably. We wanna divide it in a way that everybody is fairly treated and it's equally distributed. So we need, a, we need to appoint somebody to do this, right? Or a group of people to do this. Who are we gonna appoint? Well, we're gonna appoint someone who we could say is ideally rational. That's the crucial thing. See, Dworkin, behind everything that he's doing is this idea of this ideal judge. He calls this judge Hercules, Judge Hercules. And when we ask ourselves, is there a right answer to a question, what we're gonna do is say, well, what would Hercules decide, right? WWHD. And we want to use this ideal rational person 
because we want again to say to anybody who starts to dispute the distribution that look if you were rational and, and you had all the information you would have come to the same decision too and so you have no reason to complain so that's why the ideal requires someone who's ideally rational so we, we say we have this ideally rational person or group of people and that they're going to supervise the distribution. And the principle they're going to use is what he calls the envy test. Now, what is the envy test? Well, he doesn't put it like this, but I think it encapsulates much better what he means. And that is, look, after the distribution had been made, no one feels like they got the shorter end of the stick. No one, no one feels bitter. Now, we're not saying that everybody's satisfied. It's different, you see. It might be that the resources we have are such that there are going to be people who don't like any of the resources um, or don't feel that they have enough. But the thing is, is what they're not going to be able to do is complain about the distribution and say they were treated unfairly. So now he says we're going to use feelings to determine this, but ideal feelings, two parts to this envy principle. First of all, no one prefers someone else's bundle or share of resources over their own. If that's true, then it's been distributed pretty equally, hasn't it? But it's got to be more than that, you see? Because let's say that I'm the one who's distributing, and there's a huge variety of different resources, but what I do is I really like pizza. And so I, you know, trade to some other island that nobody knows about, um, and take all this huge resources just to get really good New York pizza. And then I take that pizza, same amount for everybody, and give it off to everybody. Well, in one sense, the first part of the envy test is fulfilled, isn't it? No one will prefer anybody else's bundle of pizza to anybody else's. But here's the problem. Maybe there are people who don't like pizza. I know it's, it's, it's hard to believe, but it's possible. And so they're going to feel that they got the shorter end of the stick, didn't they? Not because they prefer someone else's amount of pizza to theirs, but they don't like pizza to start with, and now they're stuck with that. So they're going to feel like other people's preferences were favored over theirs. And so thus the second part of the envy test is that this division has to be such that no one feels that they were left out of the equation and the distribution, that their personal ambitions and things like that were left out. Because remember, our equal distribution of resources has to respect equal concern, but also equal respect. And so, therefore, we're going to have to do it in a different way. In other words, there are two ways that, that if, this is, if this principle is to be met, that we can't use, okay? The first is the flat di di division idea. And of course, there are a lot of problems with that. Maybe things are just not divisible by the number of immigrants that we have so that we can divide it equally among them. But there's another problem, and that's the problem that <clears throat> this flat division, in order for us to keep this equality of resources throughout the time of people's lives on that island, it's going to have to constantly be redone. Because once you divide everything, they have the resources, people start trading, don't they? And they start producing. And that eventually produces this inequality of resources again. And if it's the, the, the principle that I'm using, Judge Hercules is using, is this flat division principle, then every year I'm just going to redivide everything. I'm going to take them from the more and give to the less. I'm going to be like Robin Hood, rob from the rich to give to the poor. But now I have a problem. Because then, what's the point of doing anything? There's no point of pursuing my own goals or, or trying to be successful in anything I'm going to do. Because no matter what I do, at the end, it's all going to be taken away from me and redistributed. And I'll end up the same as I did before without doing anything. And so then this ends up kind of like Tocqueville's problem, right? That if I do this unconditional division and giving of charity to everyone so that they get the same amount no matter what, then it produces a group of people who aren't respected and aren't allowed to have incentive to pursue their own projects in life. So we don't want to do that. You see, that's the problem of communism. 
That's the problem of a regulated economy. But we don't want to go to the other extreme either. What is called the equal starting point theory, or sometimes called the principle of equal opportunity, because it's not really equal distribution either. You see, when I have this equal starting point, say I give everybody the same amount of money, and then I say, go, be free, free market. Again, we get trading, production, all of these things occur. And what, does, what do people's success depend on? Well, a lot of it depends on things that I have no control over. For example, let's say in the society that results on this desert, desert island, production of, of like wicker baskets made from palm leaves is really valuable. But I'm not very good at basket weaving. Then what? Then, I'm going to get the shorter end of the stick, but it's not going to be because of something that was in my control. It's going to be for something that I don't have control over, and that's not having a talent to weave baskets because I have three left thumbs. And so, thus, the equal starting point is not really equal because it, it penalizes people for things that are not under their control, that they don't have responsibility for, and therefore unequally distributes in the end. Because remember, justice is all about that I should suffer the consequences for my choices, not for things that are not under my control, if I'm going to respect people equally anyway. So then, what's the best method? He says the best method that the ideal envy person, the ideal Judge Hercules would, would give us is what is called the auction. Judge Hercules would become an auctioneer. And this is how he would do it. Instead of dividing the resources outright, he would give everybody an equal amount of, say, seashells. So everybody starts with an equal amount of money because we'll have these seashells just represent the total GDP of all the resources. And everyone gets an equal amount. That's crucial. So they have equal purchasing pro um purchasing power in a kind of free market, you see? So he's trying to combine the best of both of these, and this is crucial. So then the members then, what do they do? They bid for the resources. So let's say there's a certain amount of pizza, and you know, I like pizza, and I think, look, and no other food compares. So I'm gonna value pizza, say, more than everybody else. And thus, what this is gonna do is it's going to give us three benefits that fulfill this equality of resources, at least initially, anyway, okay? The first is that it fulfills the envy, envy principle initially. Because here's the thing. In an auction, here's what happens. Everybody gets to buy what they want. So if I'm the auctioneer, I hold pizza up and I say, and I start with the price, right? Whatever price I start, it's not gonna be the final price, unless what? unless only one person is willing to pay that price. But that's the crucial thing. In an auction, if more than one person is willing to pay that price, then you bid up, then the, then the auctioneer has to raise the price until what? Until each particular resource has exactly one person willing to pay that price and only that person. And you start the prices lower than you expect to get, so that when you finally get to the point where there's only one person willing to pay, they paid a fair price. Why? Because they didn't take advantage of anybody else. Everyone had an opportunity to buy it. And when someone eventually got it, they didn't pay less than anybody else who's willing to pay. And so the price was set fairly. No one got it at a cheaper deal but no one got it at an exorbitant deal more than anybody would be willing to pay. And so the auction sets a fair price. So no one can complain that they were cheated. But also, it fulfills the envy principle precisely because when all the goods are divided through this method, no one will prefer anybody else's bundle to anybody else's because they will have weighed what they have as they got as much as they could what they preferred. And if they look at someone else's bundle and they see something they wanted, they had an equal amount of opportunity to buy that too, but they didn't value it as much to pay as high a price as the other person. And so therefore, they got the result of their own choice. Everyone's preference was respected, and so the envy principle will be fulfilled. 
but also it respects people's preferences, doesn't it? It allows people to make the decision as to which parts of the resources are more valuable to them and therefore what they're going to be willing to spend more on. And so thus, this auction principle would do a great job in initially dividing the, the resources. But of course, that's the initial division. We still have problems. And the problems of what happens now that the resources are divided and people start trading and producing. Will this equality, this principle of envy, still be fulfilled in the process of letting the free market go? And he's going to argue no under certain conditions. And therefore, we're going to have to put on the auction some type of insurance. And we'll talk more about that in our next lecture.